proud of the first of our invited speakers tonight. Um, Susanna Evans is a poet from Sheffield whose yeah. work has appeared in Magma, The Rialto and The North magazine. And she has a pamphlet called Confusion Species, um, which was the winner of the 2011 Poetry Business Book Competition. You can purchase a copy over there at the merch table for five pounds um, from Susanna after this. Um, and she has also been poet in residence at Bank Street Arts. So welcome, Susanna. Yeah. I just need to do some slight adjustments. Jump! Hey! Isn't it? Oh, that's yeah. <coughs> I think that, that's all right. Um, right. So I'm in Leeds, so I'm going to read a Leeds poem because that makes sense. Um, I I live in Sheffield now, but I lived in Leeds for uh, a a good a good while. I did, I did really like it while I was here, but things things change. Um, <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to hold that down. Um, this is, and also things do change because this building doesn't exist anymore. Um, the poem's <coughs> called Leeds International Swimming Pool, and um, it, uh, it's. I used to go there for a swim when I first moved here, but now it's uh, it's been raised to the ground, hasn't it? And um, it's and it was never quite international <laughs> because. They dug the pit the right size, but they put the tiles in and they just made it a little bit too small uh, for it to be 50, me 50 proper metres. So uh, that's the next of this anyway. Leeds International Swimming Pool. We took a crowbar to a locked door. Inside the paint flaked, changing room curtains shivered with unseen rats. Sweeping headlights silhouetted rows of empty tip-up chairs as we edged onto the diving board, testing its spring, and stared down into a mess of table legs, road cones and spilled glass. Grip dropped, crackling applause into the pit. The graffiti said, Welcome to Leeds, now fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> we stood in the deep end on yellow tiles, a place our feet had never touched. I'm quite keen on the idea of urban exploration, but I've just not got the balls to really do it, so <laughs> that's, that's the way that was going. Um, I'm going to read a poem about the end of the world now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm going to read two, yeah, two poems about the end of the world, actually. Um, but yeah, there, there are all these things that are meant to... Uh, all these... We're kind of living in a pre-apocalyptic time when all these things are going to creep up on us. And this was um, a few years ago, something called, uh, the poem is called Rapture, and this, is, it, this was one of the end of the world ideas, uh, one of these events that was supposed to happen. On the day that was the world was supposed to end, we drove up to the cow and calf, descended the moor for a cream tea and walked back. On our way, an old man made conversation about the ducklings on the pond. It turned six at Wheatwood Roundabout, and I watched for the saved, ascending through their sunroofs, legs swinging in the ether. Looking up, I saw only the laburnum trees rustling their gold. <laughs> Hearts. <laughs> if you read a poem, this is like the closest poem to a, a love poem that I've ever written that I would actually read out in front of people um, because I think I'm awful at writing love poems. Um, but it's also about the end of the world a bit as well, so you know, which is something I worry about clearly a bit too much. Uh, this is called a contingency plan. So. Um, for a while I was living in Leeds, <coughs> my partner was living in Sheffield, and there was a bit of a worry, you know, what happens if, uh, if the world, you know, if, if the apocalypse comes <laughs> and we're apart. I was very worried about this, so I wrote a poem, so he'll know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> and it's called A Contingency Plan. What if we're apart when the asteroid comes or the magnetic storm that shuts off the power? 
You could be waiting for a train as the sun's bulb flickers out high above the glass panelled roof. I'll be at work. We'll lose the phone lines. The door entry system will go haywire. <laughs> I will eat from the vending machine, <laughs> drink from the competition <coughs> cupboard, <laughs> and sleep on nylon carpet with my colleagues, all of us three weeks unwashed. Stay where you are. I'll abseil down eight floors on a rope, fashioned from the supply of festive tinsel. <laughs> Loot M&S. Steal a bike and make for the M1. <laughs> Forty miles of silence and abandoned cars. So we can witness the collapse of civilization with a picnic of high-end tins. <laughs> so I can lie in your arms on a rooftop, our dirty faces lit by fires. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's when the fire falls around. <laughs> We'd be much better doing it the other way. I'm going to read a poem about writing poems now, which makes me feel a bit funny because I'm still not sure if I think that's a good idea. But um, so it's, it's more sometimes. Um, you get, when you sort of go places for things relating to poetry and you end up meeting people who, who really want to impart their knowledge to you about how it's done. <laughs> and, and it's a mystery, isn't it? Because you can talk to writers about how you write. We were doing it before we started and, you know, it is mysterious because sometimes it just works and sometimes it doesn't work. And um, this is someone who was, uh, this is based on, a conversation I had with someone who was very keen to tell me, to tell me how it's done, and maybe took, took himself a little bit too seriously. <laughs> it's called The Line, which is important. <clears throat> Initiates, well done on reaching this stage. We have been enchanted by your metaphors, amused by your wit, downright moved by your turn of phrase. Welcome to your third and final test. Sebastian, turn on the light. <laughs> this is the cellar, your home for the next 48 hours, and you are here to find the line. <laughs> Remember, this room has been mother and father to every great writer in the English language. In 1955, Geoffrey Hill crawled out of here after the same challenge that you face today. His body was broken, but he held in his hands a ream of truth. <laughs> when you have the line, the line is the poem, and the poem is you, and the line is you. <laughs> did I say voice? I did not say voice. You are here for the line. Yeah. <laughs> Drink as much as you can. Many an excellent line has been laid down on a diet of free wine and no dinner. <laughs> there will be no dinner. <laughs> If you feel the urge to speak, please repeat one that April with its shortest suitor until it passes. Put on your loincloths. <laughs> if the line doesn't come to you in the next two days, it probably never will. Here's a biro. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read a poem now, which is, um, it's sort of based on these TV programmes that I don't really understand that are on the television these days, that, that they, they are purportedly reality, <laughs> but they're not because they can't, because there must be some sort of script um, specifically made in Chelsea, which I watched as research. <laughs> um, and you know, um, and this that the Essex business as well, which I must admit I haven't watched very much of that. But the sort of the idea that it is it is real, but it isn't real, and you're supposed to feel sad for people or happy for people, but you but it, but then you know it's they're just pretending, so it's like too I don't know. It just it's just too confusing for me, and it's called real life anyway. The producers decided things were getting slow. 
So I caught you with Arabella at the charity regatta, delivered a flute of strawberry champagne to your blazer, a slap to her fine-boned cheek. It took four takes to get it red enough. <laughs> Later, they rebuilt our living room in a studio, no details spared, so they could light it perfectly as I sobbed into a silk scarf you'd given me. Looking back on the Christmas special, when we first got together, which was edited in with sad music, the slow motion laughter of our former selves. My figure became small in the centre of the shot as the camera crept out, gaze lingering on every piece of furniture as if it wanted to remember. Nice. Yeah. So I'm going to read that now. Uh, I lived in um, I lived in Meanwood when I lived in Leeds, so it's about that. It's about that part of uh, part of town, and also the fact that there are tunnels, so you can get from part of Meanwood, you can get all the way into town underground by following the river under. Like, Have you ever been tunnel. in them? No, I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> Underground in the new Meanwood. Reports of a Waitrose remain unconfirmed. <laughs> in the tunnels that flush the city's length, the frogmen speak enough rat to gossip, and the rats make themselves understood. They all run from the floods under Mabgate, where the brick arches could be the county arcade after a decade of water, the gold paint washed off. They have words for the different footfalls, echoes, tyres overhead. Sometimes they surface at night into the cold air of sheep scar, stare up concrete shoots of starstone dark and listen to the mechanical lungs of gasometers while a man with a torch seals the tar on another new build roof, impossibly close to the sky. <laughs> One now. One more now. Is that right? Is that time wise? Yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, this is called the Floating City. Uh, there's apparently somewhere a lot of money being put into research um, on how we're all going to manage when the water level rises. And these floating cities are part of that idea that we'll all sort of live on little pods on the water. Um, so this is. Um, this is kind of the idea of uh, that expanded kind of to, well it's based on, it's sort of the idea of Sheffield actually and that it, I think it would want to be its own floating city, so uh, it's that idea. We got away in the early hours, split the difference halfway across the shopping centre car park. Business people at pre-work gyms were first to hear the creak of land good buying land as they ran and cycled from no place to another. Signals went red just in time, trains nose end to end along the station platform. The ocean sprang out before us like a pop-up tent. We travelled rudderless with a following wind, trailing power lines and manhole ladders. To Scandinavia, announced the master navigator, we googled the attractions. From the top of Cemetery Hill we watched Wales, each one its own landmass. The motorway was nothing but a frayed edge. The chief cartographer placed a long distance call for more blue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.